municipal updates. We look forward to a great presentation today. I'll be your session moderator. Uh, I'm Joe Gillis. I work for AECOM. I've lived in the area since 2007. I work for AECOM and I'm on a contract with GDOT on the TIA program. And it's a pleasure to be here today. I've been able to moderate summer seminar. Every year I've been able to be here, that's since 2018. And I know it's a privilege to be here. I was, it was 11 years I was in this area before I got to come to this conference. So if you're a first timer, I welcome you. I know there were several first timers uh, this morning. I saw your hand raised. A little pro tip before I get started. I'd never gone over to Jekyll Island until yesterday. My wife and I went over there and saw the Driftwood Beach. It's really cool if you've never done it. It's really it's something I've never seen anything like that before. So I want to highlight that. So I'll go into our, our speakers. Our first speaker is Joe Allen. He's from the Gwinnett Place CID. He's going to be giving an update on the GP CID and other county CIDs, including the redevelopment of Gwinnett Place Mall. Uh, Joe started his career with Gwinnett County in the Tax Commissioner's Office, actually. He served as Director of Administration and was Chief Deputy Tax Commissioner. Then later, he was Gwinnett's Division Director of Risk Management and Employee Services. He also spent a number of years as the Director of Public Affairs and Business Resources for the Gwinnett Chamber of Commerce. While there, he helped organize the business leaders, what later became the Gwinnett Place Community Improvement District. In April 2006, Joe was named Executive Director for the CID. He's married to Melanie and they have two children. I present Joe Allen. Well, good afternoon. Well, that was pretty good. Okay, I mean, I understand it's getting ready to start raining outside, so you couldn't be at the beach anyway. But glad you're here, and thank you for allowing me to share some great things that are happening with Gwinnett's six CIDs. Let's see, here we go. First, I want to make certain everybody understands what a CID is. We are a self-taxing district. I don't work for Uncle Sam. I don't work for Governor Kemp. I don't work for Chairwoman Hendrickson, though I work with all of those entities. But I work for the property owners that have formed the Community Improvement District around the Gwinnett Place Mall area who are self-taxing themselves. As you can see, we have CIDs now scattered throughout Metro Atlanta, from downtown to North Fulton, South Fulton, Aerotropolis, uh, again, Gwinnett, we have six, and they're all over. Started in the mid-1980s, uh, Johnny Isaacson, when he was a state senator, took the lead on that and formed the first CID, uh, Cumberland CID, back in, like I said, the mid-1980s. Uh, CIDs, we are created by the Georgia General Assembly, local legislation, a resolution of the local uh, governing authority, and then the property tax owners have to sign a form saying, I want to be a part of this thing called a CID. We help jumpstart initiatives, whether it be quality of life or transportation in each of our areas. We each report to our own individual board of directors who are elected by the commercial property owners. And the neat thing about CID is we're not just another layer of government because we have a six year uh, life cycle. At the end of six years, a vote is held. Actually, my CID will be up for a vote next April to say, do we do this again? Or we gave the college try, didn't work out, so now we need to shut this thing back down. So again, it has a lot of accountability to the CID boards, their staff, to make certain that we're doing our job, and that is providing a return on investment. As I mentioned, we have six CIDs in Gwinnett County. Just real quick to let you know where they're located, the Evermore CID was the force, first one formed there on Highway 78. They run from the Cab Gwinnett line up to about the middle of Snellville, if you know where Snellville is. Gwinnett Place CID, we were the second formed. Uh, we are the 2,000 acres or so right around Gwinnett Place Mall there at Pleasant Hill and Steve Reynolds Boulevard. The next one, and actually the largest CID in the state of Georgia, is the Gateway 85 CID, and there again, Along the 85 corridor, Jimmy Carter Boulevard, Indian Trail, Beaver Ruin, go over to Norcross, Peachtree Corners, and then get start moving down toward uh, the Stone Mountain area. The Lilburn CID was formed in 2010, primarily in the city limits of Lilburn along Highway 29, but they do pull in a little bit into unincorporated Gwinnett County. Brazelton CID, though they're primarily focused up towards Chateau Alon in the city of Brazelton, they do pull a little bit into Gwinnett County, so we claim them as one of our own. And the new kid on the block is the Sugarloaf CID. 
uh, that was formed there around Sugarloaf Mills, the Gas South District, if you know that part of Gwinnett County. I think the thing that makes Gwinnett CID very unique is that we work together. Though, yes, we're all competitors, over the years we found out we get more, especially from Gwinnett County, if we come in and get our game plan organized together and then present that to Gwinnett County. Uh, we also host various events to, uh, together. We worked uh, with the uh, Chamber of Commerce back in April and hosted a very successful uh, economic development uh, initiative or summit for the, uh, for the county. I want to spend with you just a few moments to talk about the four roles I think of Gwinnett CIDs that make us unique. First is we're advocates for our property owners and our businesses. Many times a business in my area may not know who to go call at Gwinnett County. But because we visit with every business that opens up in our area, they know who their CID is, they know they can get to us, and then we will get them to the right people. The uh, Brazelton CID is well known for hosting numerous events, especially their St. Patrick's Day uh, celebration and events during um, Black Friday and things of that nature to remind people of all the good things in their community. Again, with our CID, we host unique things such as candidate forums. Uh, we do a lot of Google ads. We're uh, doing mailers to remind people, hey, there's 2,800 great businesses in our area, over 170 amazing restaurants. Come and, and uh, be aware of that and come and spend your money in our area. One thing we did during the pandemic was we created a, what we call a mobile channel, where again, we were out promoting our businesses to let the public know, hey, these hotels, these 20 hotels have reopened. The Bahama Breeze is reopened, the Chili's, the Iron Age uh, Korean barbecue joint, all of them are open and they're serving you in a safe uh, manner. The second thing the CIDs do, which really all CIDs do, is we have a legacy of infrastructure investment partnerships. The CIDs on our own, we don't bring in enough money to be able to build a bridge or uh, to do a major intersection improvement, but we do have enough money that we can prime the pump. We can start doing the necessary studies and other things to move a project forward and hopefully get it moved closer to implementation than in, if it just languished, say, in, a, in the county's uh, list of wannabe projects. Of course, the Brazelton uh, CID, they're known for the uh, life path, which connects various nodes of their community. The Lilburn CID is really focused right now on various intersection improvement projects up and down Highway 29 as well as uh, they're currently working on an ARC LCI study. The Gateway 85, again, they're on Interstate 85, they have the incredible corridor that they're working on that would link uh, the Tucker Summit area, Mountain Industrial Boulevard area, up toward Norcross and uh, Peachtree Corners. They've done a lot of work on mobility mo uh, for tra traffic and truck um, a movement in their area. They have also added over 18 miles of sidewalks in their area and again have worked on numerous intersection improvement projects. And of course, if you've been on Interstate 85 heading north coming from Atlanta, you have the diverging diamond interchange there at 85 that really has made a major improvement to moving along Jimmy Carter, but also it has become a symbol as you enter into Gwinnett that you're coming into a very dynamic, amazing community. Gwinnett's downtown, which is the Sugarloaf CID area, like uh, Gateway, are working on numerous uh, intersection improvement projects for their area. They're in the middle of an LCI study right now where they're working to build upon the bus rapid transit study that was completed uh, July of last year. And they're looking at additional uh, details related to possible stops for BRT in their area when and if transit is, um, uh, is approved in, the Gwinnett, in Gwinnett County. Of course, they've been working on the Loop Trail, our version of the Beltline, and this has been a great partnership between the Gwinnett Place CID, ARC, Gwinnett County, and Sugarloaf, and this will link the Gwinnett Place area up to Sugarloaf, on around to Swanee, back around toward Duluth, back to Gwinnett Place. I had mentioned the BRT study that was completed, and this is, a, to me, a great example of how the partnership is with Gwinnett CIDs. Three of the CIDs put money into uh, into the till, shall we say, along with the ARC and Gwinnett County to complete this study. Those same CIDs in the county are now, since that was completed last July, are doing a phase two of this, going into more detail as to where stations 
and other things that need to be resolved so that once transit is approved in Gwinnett County, we're very hopeful that the Satellite Boulevard BRT will be the first major project out of the box uh, for transit. Of course, they're involved with streetscaping improvements, branding of the Sugarloaf area. Right now, Alyssa Davis is working with the team on uh, various gateway um, signage that, as you come into Sugarloaf, very involved with the arts. And actually, all CIDs are. All CIDs just uh, about six months ago joined with Gwinnett County to fund what we're calling the Creative Community Master Plan that what looks at how arts can improve our community with a focus of putting arts in many of the, shirt of the uh, CID areas. Of course, the Evermore CID, um, they've been working over the years and have put in various uh, phases of a parallel road that runs parallel to Highway 78 have put in a roundabout and other improvements, and some of you may have been involved with them in Gwinnett County and GDOT uh, on this initiative. And they've really, over the years, taken what had been a very unsafe uh, major uh, corridor in our area to something that's attractive, safe, and is moving vehicles very efficiently. And finally, the Gwinnett Place area when it comes to infrastructure improvement. We have the first DDI in, uh, in Gwinnett County, the second one in Georgia, but we're not uh, resting on our laurels. We're actually working with Andrew and the team at uh, KCI and uh, Atlas looking at, okay, what do we need to do to improve the efficiency of that DDI to stretch out its life uh, cycle? Alex and Rob are, are here somewhere at the conference, but they uh, work with us on the traffic signal optimization program where we're squeezing as much efficiency out of the traffic signals, the 49 intersections there at Gwinnett Place as possible. And again, none of these projects would be happened had there not been a CID to take the lead, to move this forward, and yes, to be an annoyance sometimes to the county and the state and the feds to make these projects happen. We've got a lot of other things planned throughout our area. We have put in close to 17 miles of sidewalks. And you may say, okay, I keep hearing sidewalks. Why is that important? If you look at the socioeconomics, especially where most of the CIDs are located, a lot of the folks that call that area home they may have one vehicle if they're lucky. And so there's a lot of people walking that area, getting to their job at Chili's, at McDonald's, or at you know, whatever store they might be working on. So sidewalks, having one that is lit, well-maintained, landscaped with benches is very important. Plus we have 20 hotels, as I mentioned, in that area. It's neat in the morning to see those guests from the Sinesta or the Fairfield Inn get out and do a morning jog where there's a sidewalk today where there wasn't one, say, several years ago. And of course, we do a lot of branding. The third thing the CIDs do is we're focused on quality of life initiatives. And these are simple things such as beautification. Each of the CIDs have probably spent millions of dollars to put in hundreds of thousands of plants and other enhancements to keep the area looking clean and inviting. We actually have a crew out five days a week, Russell Landscape, and they have removed since we started this initiative over 475 tons of trash from the 10 miles of roadway that make up the CID and over 12,000 illegal signs. Just last Tuesday, we removed 101 illegal signs from our area. And all that trash, all those illegal signs would be in each of these CIDs had the property owners not formed a CID. So little things make a big difference. Another thing that the CIDs worked on uh, together were called flock safety cameras. And this has probably been one of the best initiatives we've ever done that's had an immediate return on that investment. We have installed in our area 63 of these uh, cameras, uh, the Gateway 85, 120, the others anywhere from 15 to 20 to 30 cameras in their area. Just in the central precinct where the Gwinnett Place and Sugarloaf CIDs are located, last year alone, these cameras just in that precinct uh, helped to recover 104 stolen vehicles, left to 199 total arrests. And that's just within Central Precinct. That's not all the other four precincts in Gwinnett County or the other municipalities and police departments that we give access to our cameras. So again, these things have made a big change. Where we used to see on a typical month, maybe 20, 30 break-ins at our hotels, we're having some months now where we have zero. The most we've had, two or three, and that's it. So these things have been a great initiative for the CIDs that again make Gwinnett CIDs a little different from our brothers and sisters elsewhere who probably may not be focused on things like quality of life initiatives. 
And finally, for the Gateway and the Gwinnett Place CIDs, we have community patrols in our area to augment what the police are doing, and they serve as ambassadors to our businesses, to our guests. And um, for us, for example, our patrols are out seven days a week, 7 a.m. to 1 a.m. And they're helping people jumpstart their car, give directions, they're being eyes and ears for, excuse me, for Gwinnett County Police. The Sugarloaf CID, they've invested in various signs to remind people to do common sense things such as lock your vehicle, remove valuables. And finally, the CIDs are focused on economic development. Where you see each of our areas, if you talk to a typical Gwinnettian, you'd mention Gwinnett Place Mall or Jimmy Carter Boulevard, you might get a, ooh, yuck, type of impression. But we remind people, for example, Gateway has a $16.6 .6 billion annual economic impact of their 14 square mile district. The Gwinnett Place area has a $13.4 billion economic impact for the 2,000 acres that make up the Gwinnett Place area. So we do this to remind people that there's a lot of positive things in these areas. We just might need a little bit of help, a little bit of assistance to really blow that $13.4 billion out of the water. And then also, we are working, especially the Gateway and uh, Gwinnett Place CIDs, on putting various incentives in place, such as opportunity zones, tax allocation districts, uh, redevelopment overlays, again, all to promote business growth and jobs in our area. And finally, in my remaining time, I want to share with you a little bit about a major initiative from ICID, and that is the purchase of Gwinnett Place Mall. Over the last several years, uh, the CID has been that annoying little brat, I guess you could say, with our county leadership saying, it's the mall, stupid. Do something about Gwinnett Place Mall. And thanks to that lobbying, um, county did purchase Gwinnett Place Mall in April of last year. And hopefully, most of you may know where Gwinnett Place is, especially if you're from the metro Atlanta area. If not, it's on 85 in Ple uh, Pleasant Hill in the strategic heart of Gwinnett County. For a teenager in the 1980s, that was the center of the universe. Uh, of course, if you're Netflix fans, you may have seen them, uh, the mall star in Stranger Things over the last several, um, several seasons. But as soon as the county purchased it, we got together working with the Atlanta Regional Commission, the county, to, okay, how are we, what are we gonna do with it now? How are we gonna move this thing forward? We selected the uh, team from VHV, who's put together a group of mall redevelopment specialists from across the nation. We kicked off last mid-September. We'll be completing this journey uh, by the end of August. And that was our way of keeping the dream alive, of doing something about the mall. Took all that, put that together, re-looked at it, and said, okay, this is no longer applicable. This was never going to happen. And so let's come up with a common sense market-driven, market-feasible approach to redeveloping this mall. We did initial early engagement. We were at every fall festival, every holiday festival that was taking place at Gwinnett in Gwinnett County, interacted with probably well over a thousand Gwinnettians to find out what they wanted, what they didn't want. And let me tell you, I got no, no one saying, why did y'all buy that crazy mall? It was 100%, thank you for doing that. What it took you so long, let's make something happen. We've done an extensive market analysis, again, that's very data-driven. Uh, we had to, uh, a lot of people had some grand ideas of 25-story plus towers going in at Gwinnett Place Mall. We had to kind of bust those bu bubbles and say, mm, not in our lifetime is that gonna happen, but here's what can happen. We've hosted a series of workshops, had a very successful one just in April where we brought businesses together, the other property owners at the mall site to get their input. Throughout that process and that public engagement, we came up with two concepts. One was called the Mixed Use Town Center. The second was called the Diversity Cultures in that area. We then, this past spring up until um, the end of June, went back out, re-engaged with the community. Did we hear you right? What do we need to do different? What needs to be tweaked? What needs to change? And again, total, we've probably interacted with over 2,500 Gwinnettians uh, over the last several months. Took that and the Global Villages concept uh, was born. And so right now we're focusing on that. It will be highly residential, some office, some um, maybe hotel, structured parking. It will have a cultural center in there. Uh, the, the majority of the mall will come down. However, Macy's, Mega Martin, Beauty Master, two, the three remaining anchors in that area, 
will remain per their desire to be a part of a redevelopment scenario. We're looking at a vibrant central park that will take the place of that main um, uh, place where the mall used to be. Uh, again, the, the world class is what we're, we're taught calling it. Again, will be a very walkable, transit-oriented development. Uh, we're working again with Andrew and the folks at uh, Atlas and KCI on a series of key mobility improvements that are going to have to take place to support this because we're bringing in a ton of folks into an already congested area. Looking at a new roadway network that will go on that 90 acres inside Ring Road. Of course, transit will be an important aspect of this. How will that fit in with the Satellite Boulevard BRT? And then also the county's plans to, uh, to have a uh, region-wide uh, park trail network. And so how can we fit in with that? Uh, th there'll be a very detailed implementation strategy. Like I say, will be finished by the end of August. We're now uh, reviewing everything with our partners at Gwinnett County, Partnership Gwinnett, the Gwinnett Chambers and others. And I just hit on the very top high level of what's in the plans. If you go to gwinnettplace2b.com, you can get more detail and that's also where we'll put the uh, the final documents once everything is said and done. Because at the end of the day, we've got a community that's committed to going from this a piece of property that was very successful, really put Gwinnett County on the map in the mid 1980s to something that's gonna continue to make certain Gwinnett County remains the most dynamic and exciting place to live, work, and, uh, and raise a family. And finally, just want to end with a quote. I'm a Disney uh, freak. I love Walt Disney. Uh, the mouse has gotten a lot of my money over the years with my kids. But when I saw this quote from Walt Disney, I'm like, you know what? This is exactly what Gwinnett CIDs are focused on. Around here, we don't look backwards for very long. We keep moving forward, opening up new doors, doing new things, leading us down new paths. When I started this job several years ago, someone said, I thought you were going to make Gwinnett Place Mall great again. And I'm like, no, that's the path. We're never going back there. The 80s and 90s are long gone. We've got to open up new doors and form a new path. And I think that's what each of Gwinnett's CIDs are doing for each of our little slices of heaven there in what I believe is the greatest county. Sorry about the cab, though we love the cab. In the state of Georgia, and that is Gwinnett County. I encourage you to, uh, to stay up to date on what's happening with all of Gwinnett's CIDs. We're all on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, all that kind of good stuff. These are the, uh, uh, the places for the Gwinnett Place area. But thank you again for allowing us to share just a little bit about the positive things happening in Gwinnett's six CIDs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Appreciation for being one of our speakers today. Thank you. I want to transition to our next presentation. If you have any questions, please hold them, and we'll have a time at the end to do a Q&A. Our second speaker today is Sylvia Smith. She's with DeKalb County. She's going to be presenting on the DeKalb 2050 Unified Plan. Sylvia attended Tuskegee University, just down the road from where I went to Auburn, where she received her degree in architecture. After graduation, Sylvia worked as a junior architect designing prototype elementary schools. Some of her accomplishments were designing the layout, interior color schemes, and project management for Medlock Bridge and Winburn Elementary School. Some of your children may attend or have attended those schools. Afterwards, Sylvia worked as a consultant for the city of Birmingham, managing CIP projects for streetscapes, parks, and stormwater projects. She has 24 years of work experience with the Cab County government, and during this time, she's managed the science and marketing contract for traffic engineering, managed the traffic calming program, and now manages the long range planning division with the Department of Planning and Sustainability. Her current responsibilities include land use planning, transportation planning, and sustainability initiatives. While at DeKalb, she's received a certification from UGA Public Works Management National Certification Level, as well as UGA DeKalb County Bright Futures Leadership and Development Emerging Executives Track. She also served as the past president for the Metro Atlanta Chapter of American Public Works Association and past membership chair for District 4, the American Public Works Association. 
He worked with other professionals in both the public and private sectors to help improve the quality of life for everyday citizens. She's an aide to Decatur, Georgia, has two sons, Michael and Aaron. I want to present Sylvia Smith. Good afternoon, everyone. So are we awake or are we kind of asleep after lunch? Okay, well, how many DeKalb residents do we have in here? So with all the DeKalb residents in here, I know that you all have read or looked at our plan, or if not, by the time we finish this presentation, you all will play a part in being involved in the plan. So this, I'm gonna talk about our 2050 Unified Plan, I'm going to discuss the public engagement portion of the plan. So let me back up. So first of all, this plan would not be possible without ARC. And secondly, our consultants, Kimberly Horn. And I would also like to recognize uh, my director who's here for planning and sustainability, Andrew Baker. So if y'all have any questions, direct all your questions to Andrew Baker. <laughs> And then finally, I do want to um, also recognize the person who actually pays all the bills on planning and sustainability. And without that, and I know I go to her 24 seven about money and pan and what we need to do. And she's like, how these contracts work, how this work. So she's here today to kind of learn what we do. And this is her first session, so it doesn't go to. So from there, um, so these are our partners for the 2050 Unified Plan. As I said, ARC, uh, the CAB, our Board of Commissioners, our CEO, leadership departments and leadership in the CAB, our cities and, um, and the city of Atlanta, uh, the CAB School Board, our CID, uh, Community, GDOT, and DCA. So on our agenda tonight, we're gonna talk about the purpose well, today, it's not tonight. So I'm used to having night meetings, so forgive me. But the purpose, the project overview, the 2050 Unified Plan benefits, leadership and stakeholder partnerships, community outreach, major takeaways from the public engagements, our schedule, and then our questions. So the purpose. The purpose, we actually, when we looked at the 2050 Unified Plan, we said, what do we want to get out of this? You know, and it's kind of ironic that of the theme for this, because this is kind of the theme of our 2050 Unified Plan and what we want to do. And so the purpose of this engagement is to create a unified plan that will engage our citizens, enhance communities, stimulate growth, reduce plan updates, and create a sense of place. And also establish a transportation nexus that builds upon the existing conditions and needs assessments to bring transportation and land use elements together. Project overview. So this is DeKalb's first unified plan. And so not only is this the first unified plan for DeKalb, I know that there are some other counties that have, and possibly cities that have done unified plans, such as Cobb and Gwinnett, and there are probably some others, but this is our first one. And not only is this our first, RC's first unified plan. And so we were doing a pilot study with ARC uh, for this plan. And so this plan is actually an update to two of our main plans that we have, which is our 2014 transportation plan, which included local projects and policies from the county and the cities, and also updates of, from our 2035 comprehensive plan. Now our comprehensive plan, we completed our update in 2021, but because we wanted these plans to be on the same track, we actually did a, another update to it, which is going on now, so that both of them will be completed at the same time. And we've also incorporated previous plans into the study. Plan elements. Some of the elements in our plan on the transportation side, and I won't go through all of them because I know we have a lot of transportation experts in the room, and so you know um, a lot of these elements. But on the comprehensive land use side, uh, we actually looked at um, some of these elements that we looked at are elements that are missing in the cab where we need more policies or we need another plan or an update. So we included those in this plan on the land use side, like the housing, and you know we talked about housing earlier and there's a big need to really look at housing, uh, our economic development, our natural resources, sustainability, looking at um, out of this plan will come a sustainability plan in the cap, 
uh, arts and culture, uh, community health, wellness, and safety and annexations. Some of the partnerships um, that we've had have been our stakeholders, our standing committee leaderships, which are, and hey, when you get older, it's hard to see this small writing on here, so I'm just gonna kind of go through it. But our um, committee, committee leaderships are like our, our um, CEO, our commissioners, our directors um, from the various departments and even our staff from various departments. Committees on our transportation committee, there is our list of transportation committee members and our land use committee. And then our stakeholder groups, uh, we had two plus meetings with them. And I can't see that, but um, you all I know can read that and see. Um, oh, goodness, focus groups. So this is our list of focus group meetings that we had. And out of this, we also had, um, we uh, DeKalb is very diverse in terms of citizens. And so we had to really take a deep dive and look at the different communities in DeKalb. And so we actually went out and did a lot of intercept meetings with all of these that you see on the left, well, on your right. Community outreach. Um, one of the things I really loved about this picture um, that we took at our intercept meeting is what you know unified plans do and what kind of policies we do. And so what we do is we create plans and policies for future generations to come. So these plans are not for today. You know, there may be some things in there, but because of funding and those type of things, some of these things just don't happen tomorrow or next year. And so the public outreach methodology that we did, we actually sat down with our consultants and said, okay, how, because we started this project in the middle of the pandemic. And so, you know, this is a huge task to take on in a, in a, in a pandemic and figuring out how are you gonna capture your citizens and get the get everybody involved and what are you gonna do? So the first thing we looked at was um, gathering what we have in house. And so by me working in planning and sustainability, I have access to our neighborhood registry and access to our business license registry. So we compiled that data and also some of our commissioners with their list and our and with our 2014 transportation plan and our comp plan. And so we compiled all those lists and start building from there um, to get um, the, the get what we needed in terms of starting our community engagement. And so from there, we also contacted various neighborhoods to find out who are the community leaders so that they can send information out. And we also looked at um, our diverse group of participants and how are we going to interact with them. Um, we obtained proper tools. We we looked at video conferencing, online applications. Um, it was really a lot in terms of scheduling meetings, trying to avoid holidays, public hearings. And we have, pub so Tuesdays were out. Uh, we have a lot of projects going on in DeKalb, plus transportation projects going on, um, park and rec projects going on. And then we have a lot of projects going on with MARTA. And so just trying to coordinate with all to just make sure that we stayed on schedule and not have meetings that occurred on the same night. And so social media was big, uh, non-traditional meeting locations. We had a lot of intercept meetings uh, where we went out and we actually went to MARTA stations and various locations just to meet and find out what was going on in the cab area. And wherever an event was going on in the cab area, that's where we were. We met early and often um, and we did a lot of documentation. our English learning community. So this is a picture of just the different, we, we met with a lot of English learning communities, but this is just a picture to give you an example of some of the communities that we met with in the, in the interaction. And we were really grateful that we had um, citizens there that spoke the language so they could act as a barrier. Like for example, within the city of Clarkston, there are over hundred languages there. And so um, we were able to have different groups there. And so they were able to, you know, just, just talk about things and what was going on and what they were missing in their area. And it was really, um, even though I've been with the cab and I attend meetings, but the Clarkson area, um, 
most of the citizens there um, are picked up. They're not, they don't drive. So if someone comes in a car or a van, pick them up and they walk. And so they, we may not see, but uh, with them, there were a lot of areas where, you know, it was dark, security issues, you know, and that kind of thing. And so uh, that's what we asked when we first started the project, what would they like to see in 30 years? And a lot of people were like, a lot of folks were like 30 years, you know, we're never, I'll be, I'll be gone by the time we start this. And so, you know, and just having to calm them down and say, hey, some, we, we were getting the younger citizens, which weren't saying that, but people like me, everybody was like, oh, 30 years. And so uh, one of the things that we talked about was, okay, yes, this is for you. You're, you're really um, setting the goals for your future, for your kids, for your grandkids. And so with that, um, they looked and some of the things that they wanted were safety. They wanted their neighborhoods more co connected more sustainable, more diverse, and pedestrian friendly. And then there are some others up there I, that you can look at and see. I can't see it from here, I'm sorry. <laughs> and so this one, um, this is one of my favorite um, slides um, that we have. Uh, when we went out, and I don't remember what area this was, but when we did our community outreach, you know, I was so impressed by the parents. You know, they always talk about it takes a village and how you teach your children. And so I was really excited to see that most of the families that came up and they interacted with us on their boards, they talked to their kids about the different things, um, the comp plan, the transportation plan, and what's going on. And some of the kids were bikers, they tricycles, you know, they walked, but they interacted. And some of them actually talked about some things that they wanted to see in their neighborhoods. And so the parent, the kids got to, got a chance to work with their parents and actually put the dots on the board. And so to me, I just see this as part of our future. And so our stakeholder and public engagement today, since we had a lot of virtual meetings and we had some intercept meetings and not really public, public meetings in person, we had to really do a lot of meetings. And so in terms of our um, stakeholder groups, focus groups, commissioners, community council and public, to date we've had over 50 meetings and we still have some meetings to continue with. Um, our community intercepts and our community presentations, online surveys and platforms, we've had over 25 meetings. So this is a slide of our public engagement survey and website. We, we have a survey and a website. The survey is closed now, but we have a website uh, with interactive maps that we ask citizens to um, engage in. So some of the public engagement takeaways were we asked the community, what good things in DeKalb? What, what do you think is good in DeKalb and where are they happening? And so they said that their top five were Toco Hills, Emory Village, Brycliffe and Northwood Hills, North Decatur and Scott Boulevard and Oak Grove neighborhoods. And so we asked them, where would you like to see good things happen? What was happening good now? That was the first one. The second one was, where would you like to see good things happening? And so they said they would like to see good things happening around the North Decatur Mall, uh, North Lake Mall, Memorial Drive and Columbia, Claremont and Brackcliff, and I-20 and Candler Road. So then we asked about transport transportation priorities and asked what are your five top transportation and promote equity. So this is our surface transportation sales tax. So we asked now, disclaimer in this, this is not the entire DeKalb County. These are only folks that wanted to participate. Um, would you support a surface transportation sales tax? And with that group, we had 60, over 60% that said yes. And we asked, what is the maximum tax you would consider for funding surface transportation projects? And over 40% said 1%. And on the transportation funding priorities, we asked, what were your top three priorities for SPLOS funding? And so the top three priorities were access, management, road, roadway, and sidewalks. And then we asked from the intercepts, that was from the surveys that we had. So the intercept meetings that where we went out and we met with the community, 
we asked those same type of same questions and they said exit management, uh, roadway operations and sidewalks. On the transit sales tax, we asked another disclaimer, same disclaimer, uh, would you support a transit sales tax? And over 50% said yes. And what is the maximum tax you would consider for funding transit projects? And over 40% said 1%. Transit investment corridors, we asked which transit corridors should be prioritized for major transit investments. And so with that, we had our top three, which was the I-20 East Corridor, um, Buford Highway, and Candler Road. And so the schedule, we started this project in April of 2021. So we've gone through and we've had two online surveys, we've had uh, various community events, we've had public meetings, and we've had focus group meetings. And so now we're in the stage of with the comp plan portion of it, it's in a 30 day review period um, for the community. And on the transportation side, our transportation side, we're still working out our transportation projects. And so we anticipate sometime in August, um, putting that out to the public for review for 30 days. And hopefully we're hoping that we can get the plan, no, not hoping, the plan will be adopted in de by December of 2022. And so one of the things that I wanna do, I know this, this concludes my presentation, but I wanna kind of open up the floor to ask, I've shared with you some of the engagements that we do in terms of our communities, but I just wanna hear from you on some other ways or some creative ways you have um, had um, any type of engagement with your community or is there anyone that has had something different or do they do you all do basically the same things that i do oh well i guess we're doing good <laughs> okay you're absolutely right dots are always the key and color-coded dots Okay, well, thank you. That concludes my um, presentation. I want to uh, present this with token appreciation. Speaking with us today. Thank you. I know that you didn't know you were speaking to a few weeks, but I appreciate you being willing to come and be part of this presentation. And while I transition, is a reminder that if you are looking to get a PDH or sign in for ASAP, it's down there on the front of that table down there. Okay. So we were hoping to get another CID to speak and they were unable to, to come today. So we, I reached out to some of the other CIDs around Metro Atlanta and said, hey, if you send me a few slides, I'd be willing to show them at summer seminar. So that is what I have. And actually, I do want to have a disclaimer. I have some slides from Melissa Davis from Sugarloaf, but, but since Joe presented those, I will, not, I will skip past those when we get to that point. But uh, let me tell you what I do have today. If you look at the map, uh, we have the Cumberland CID, which one. And two, we have perimeter. Three, we have South Forsyth. And then we'll we'll skip past four. But that's Sugarloaf CID. And then five and six are Midtown and Atlanta downtown. So we'll be we'll have just a few slides, and this one just let everybody know kind of what's going on in other areas of the metro area. There. So the first one I'll mention is the Cumberland CID, and I put it first. Not only because it kind of made sense geographically the way I had the map laid out, but they were the first CID. And notice that it's a pretty big area. In fact, some we have our all of our meetings in the wintertime or like December in, in Magianos, which is in this this area. And I just want to note a few things that they were looking for all the same things I think all CIDs are looking for for a need for better infrastructure and for enhancements. And they asked their commercial owners to pay an additional five mils of property tax. And as you can see, they had they were able to invest 180 million, but it leveraged up to 2.5 billion. So I think that's something you see in most of these CIDs is they're able to leverage dollars. Uh, something that's an extra 
exit there is going to be cost about half a billion dollars. It's the 12th uh, access point to the system. Supposed to start next year. It's dependency on on car based travel and reduce carbon emissions. And I thank Kim Menifee for sending those to me. Got a couple slides from the parameters CID from Ann Hanlon, executive director. And just point out that um, some of GDOT's largest projects are in that area. And if you've ever driven through the 25400 interchange, that's in this area. So obviously there's a lot going on. We're also hoping to add more express lanes in that area, both up 400 on 285. Uh, they give a website if you can look for more information. And I'm going to skip past, past uh, Sugarloaf because these are, I think, about the same, pretty much the same slides uh, that's, and as Joe already shared with us. So I'll go ahead and hop on over to uh, to Midtown. So we have Midtown and then Land Downtown to wrap up my presentation with. And they got a little nice little graph here that shows uh, kind of an overhead view of, of uh, Midtown. And it shows the whole area and the items that are blue indicate projects have been delivered. Areas that are in green are in construction and the areas that are in more of an orange are, are proposed. And that was kind of a neat way to present that. And they did some uh, polling of, of what need to be done in, in their CID. And you see that they focused on walking, transit, and cycling. You know, every CID is going to have different emphasis. This being in, in a densely uh, uh, downtown area, you're going to have, this is definitely going to be the three you, you see. But you can see the, the trends go down from at the bottom of each set is 2013. And then it goes to the top is 2019. You can see that the interest in each of these, for the most part, has gone up. At least the trend has been up. Trends was a little bit down from 16, but still the trend overall is up on these areas. And here's some other slides from Midtown, uh, some projects that they've done, um, working on. Uh, these are in the pipeline. Art Walk from 10th to 11th and 12th to 13th Streets. Jennifer Street Complete Streets under construction now. Also Piedmont Avenue Complete Street now. Commercial Road Commons under construction now as well as Spring Street uh, Parklets. Total of $47 million. And one final uh, CID I'm going to present briefly today is on Atlanta downtown. And they've had two other organizations that weren't necessarily CIDs that were working in the time frame. They've kind of come together, and that was the Central Atlanta Progress and the Atlanta Downtown Improvement District. They've sort of merged, and they're, they're now working together for Atlanta downtown. And they're doing a lot of the same things that other CIDs are doing with uh, looking for needs and how to help, help their their business and, and residents in various ways. As for the geography, um, it's exactly what you would think of as being downtown. It's the area that's just south of Midtown, and it pretty much starts at I-20 on the south. It's bounded on Northside Drive on the west and Boulevard on the east. So when you think of traditional downtown Atlanta, it is this area here. And you can see that uh, if you look at the green, there's more open space than you realize in, in, in downtown Atlanta, and that's good, and also near downtown Atlanta. Uh, they've got the MARTA station zone here, as well as where the commercial rail for MARTA is, streetcar, and, you, and the actual CID is the area in, uh, in red. And kind of like cogs on a, a, a spoken wheel, uh, combined and aligned program areas, you can see they're involved a lot of the same things the other CIDs are doing with uh, looking at... Uh, Place making, public space, cleanliness, maintenance, marketing, social impact, advocacy, economic development, transportation, sustainability, and advocacy. Just a lot of those things are all kind of interconnected. And um, a lot of good things are happening in Atlanta downtown. Uh, just a little bit of a, kind of a summary of, of who they are. You notice there are also five mills. And um, that's all I had on the CIDs, but I was. Just kind of a, to add what's going on, not just in Gwinnett, we also have uh, the CIDs going on around the uh, around the metro area. And at this point, I would like to offer opportunity for anybody to come up to one of the microphones and direct your, you can come up, speak your name, and ask to speak to either Joe or Sylvia, 
And any CID question you can go ahead to Joe Allen, because I just was the messenger on, on that. So I'll go ahead and turn that over to them. Hey, um, I'm Carla Pichadley. I live in Gwinnett, and I'm excited about what y'all are doing for the mall. But I was a little bit late, so I don't know if you mentioned when, when are y'all getting started on the work, and when do y'all project to finish? You mean actual construction? Yeah, yeah, making guess, the transformation. Yeah, my guess is you're looking at, we probably won't start, you won't see anything physically, probably two years. Okay. Because after the implementation strategy is involved, uh, is, is presented to the county, then you've got the REA through civil easement agreements that have to go through. So we're going to bring in the lawyers and the accountants. And you know, when you ever bring those folks in, uh, <laughs> things grind to a halt very quickly. And we've seen this at other malls across the nation that we've visited that have gone through uh, the same uh, growing pains that Gwinnett Place is. It usually takes a couple of years or two or three years to kind of get all that stuff behind the scenes worked out before you actually start seeing something uh, come down. So I would, I'm hopeful that we'll see something sooner rather than later, but it's probably two years. And we're looking at, again, based on what we've seen at other malls, you're probably looking at a decade-long process before everything is done. There's just you know, not the capacity out there or the uh, the market quite yet for, um, you know, to take it all in one big bite. So it's, it's, it, uh, what we're pulling together is going to be a phased approach of the investments that the county has to make, everything from that Central Park to the Cultural Center to actually demolishing the mall itself and two of the anchor stores that are, are currently vacant. Uh, so, um, so we're probably looking at, you know, at least a decade before everything is said and done. Hello, I'm Patrice Keeter with DeKalb County, and I have a question for Sylvia Smith with DeKalb County. No, I just wa I just wanted to see her panic because I was thinking, what's she going to ask? Um, no, she kind of glossed over it in her presentation, but under Sylvia's leadership, and I think it should be acknowledged, um, she really has a passion for public input. And when she was talking about diversity, I'm sure everybody's county's diverse, but DeKalb is really diverse. And they have gone out of their way, and I think it should be highlighted and applauded, to um, stuff in multiple languages. I mean, you know, you ha if you have 5%, you have to do it. Like, most of us have to do Spanish. But she has gone out of her way to meet with different groups and um, include people who are really underrepresented. And I wanted to acknowledge that. Just nonstop, is that how that works? Or? Well, it's not nonstop, uh, but we're actually in an extension campaign ourselves. Uh, we've expanded our boundaries, I guess, three times. Three were, actually, a total of four times. Three were successful. The fourth time, right before the pandemic hit, uh, we got no one to sign up because they kept saying, until you do something about that small, I was going to use another word, uh, <laughs> that's across the street from us, we're not joining your organization like you know, we own the mall, which we did not at the time. Uh, the Sugarloaf CID just went through a very successful expansion process. And you have to go through the same thing. You have to get within that geographical boundary 50% plus one of the individual property owners that account for 75% of the uh, value to uh, to want to join the CID. So the vast majority of folks are, you know, have to sign on that dotted line, but you are able to sweep in a few uh, stragglers here and there. Uh, hi, I'm Carly Queen. I'm with AACOM. Um, and just building on, you know, the great work that you did, um, Sylvia, with the public engagement effort, I wonder if you could elaborate a bit more about how that was really integrated into the plan and how um, you might have, and, and the study team uh, might have kind of combined the input from the public with your other data analyses uh, processes. So with our, can you hear me? A little bit? So with our 2014 plan and our comprehensive plan, uh, we did a lot of engagement on those, on those plans. 
But I think because we were, this, this happened during a pandemic, I think that we focused a lot more in this plan, not to say we didn't do it in the other plans, but I think we focused a little more in this plan in terms of reaching out to all of the communities in DeKalb. Because we said that, you know, every, you know, we have a lot of communities that don't walk. We were trying to make sure that we reached out to everyone by um, having all of the various languages available with all of our brochures so that with the maps, they may not have been able to go in and read the maps, but in terms of just the language portion of it and having it in their language, you know, we could capture that information. And so we did capture a lot of data with that with the communities. Did I answer all of your everything? So um, we are still working on the decision making process, but we have compiled all of that information and it's part of our plan and part of um, like with public safety in some of the areas like the Clarkson area. That was a real concern there and some of the lighting. And so with that, that part is folded into our unified plan to have, and I don't, and we'll probably have an action plan where we have a five-year action plan. And so some of those elements may be part of the five-year action plan, but their voices are heard. And so we are going to pass that information on to, if it's not part of the unified plan, it'll be passed on, it will be part of the unified plan, but it will also be passed on to public safety. Joe, I know there's a, a number of uh, CIDs. I don't know the exact number, but but I would imagine it's a collaborative um, spirit between them, but also a, a competitive spirit. So with, with that though, what do you see as the biggest challenge to, uh, that's facing CIDs for them to maintain their viability? Well, I think we're seeing a lot is a lot of the commercial now going to residential. You're seeing that in Midtown and some of the ones down in Atlanta, where again, those those uh, properties that, you know, maybe 10 years ago was a, was a, you know, a business or retail or whatever. And now that's through redevelopment, which is a positive thing, is now becoming residential, which are not subject to CID taxation. They still get all the benefits of uh, being within the CID, but they don't uh, get to uh, put a few nickels and dimes uh, when the offering plate is passed. So I think that's a, that's a challenge. We're actually seeing that in the Gwinnett Place area now, uh, even before we've really experienced any major redevelopment. We've had um, three properties that are now going, that were CID paying members. They've now uh, have become um, high-end um, uh, apartment complexes. And so again, we we don't get any of those those funds, but, you know, they still, again, can, you know, uh, take advantage of the community patrols, the flock safety cameras, the, the, you know, the cleanup each week of the, the roadways and things of that nature. So I think that's something, and I know the CIDs have tried to, um, how can we tackle that? It's just, uh, it's very messy legislatively, and who knows if that can be, be solved without completely having to reform a, a, a CID. Uh, as far as working cooperatively, we, we used to all get together. We really haven't done that uh, a lot lately, but I do know the Gwinnett CIDs, we get together. Um, we're talking probably every other week, if not every week. Uh, we get together uh, individually um, as groups having, you know, lunch or breakfast together and talk about uh, challenges that we might have and also similar solutions that we might can find. Any other questions from the field? Are there any online questions on YouTube? Okay. You can just come to the microphone. Thank you. So the county bought Gwinnett Place Mall, right? They bought most of Gwinnett. A good portion of Gwinnett Place Mall. Okay. So is the county going to be the one investing the money to rebuild it? Uh, yes, we see that the county will be a public-private partnership, again, as we've seen many. Just as far as the ownership, Gwinnett County of the 90 acres, they own a little over 40 acres of that. They own the interior of the mall itself and uh, the uh, former uh, Parisian Belk Anchor Store. Uh, Macy's and owns and still operates their, uh, their department store. Um, Megamart has taken over a former department store, and they're now running a grocery 
uh, out of it. Um, it's former J.C. Penney is now owned by a company called uh, Beauty Master, and then uh, Northwood Investors uh, purchased the uh, former Sears. So we're having to coordinate with all of those owners uh, to get everybody on the same page uh, as far as what that redevelopment vision is going to be and what that strategy uh, going forward will be. And that's uh, been part of this process. So you got nobody with a big checkbook uh, on board then? Well, I would say Northwood, uh, uh, Northwood Investors, they have a very big checkbook. Uh, so we're very fortunate that they saw that. But the biggest checkbook is going to be Gwinnett County. And Gwinnett County, trust me, I've had conversations with the county administrator. I've told them, you spent 20-some-odd uh, million to buy it. Don't put your uh, checkbook away yet because there's going to be more investment that needs to be made. Some of the things I showed, the, the walkability, the de demolition just in itself, uh, the grid uh, pattern, uh, the cultural center. And all that will be uh, public uh, funding. And part of this initiative will show, give an estimate, okay, here's what we're looking at as far as cost. But more importantly, here's what's going to be the return on that investment. Yes, you're going to have to make a sizable investment if you do what you say you want to have happen at this dead mall. Uh, but that how that return will come back to the county uh, over the decades uh, to, to make certain that investment is repaid uh, and then um, extra funds result from that. If you look at the Gwinnett Place area from a tax standpoint for the last 20 years, while Gwinnett County has increased 130% overall in tax value, the Gwinnett Place area, those 2,000 acres, has increased 1%. That is staggering. Again, what's supposed to be the central business district of Gwinnett County. And so that's part of why we do these analyses to say, this is still a strong area, still has a strong economic impact per year on the county, on the state of Georgia, but Gwinnett County, because of that dead mall at the center of that business district, your property values have been static for 20 years. And the only way to move that forward is through a public-private partnership with the county taking a strong lead in making that happen. So I have one more thing. You know how you have your friends and with you and then you start talking and then you totally forget to recognize your friends? Well, doing this, I, I forgot that not only is she my sidekick, but we have also been working professionally since 1998. And I know I'm saying her age, part of the 2014 transportation plan and also this plan, Patrice, with the transportation portion. Don't cry on me, Patrice. <laughs> but I just want to say thank you. I just, uh, I'm Andrew Baker from DeKalb County. I did also want to just acknowledge the partnership between the two. But the question that was asked earlier was what were the implications in terms of the transportation and how is it going into the plan? One of the things is that when we had a plan before, we had these activity element trends that are occurring. So we are interlinking the both. I'd like to uh, thank our two speakers, Sylvia and Joe, for being here today. Let's give them a hand. We thank those who are here in person and on YouTube, and I appreciate those who came and asked questions. And my understanding that it was time for the vendor break. And I think it's 315 that we have session three. Is that correct? 315. So you got a little bit of extra time than you thought you were going to have, I think. We're about 20 minutes early. So we want to close our session. And remember, uh, PDHs and 